Welcome to the Asia Society. I'm Rachel Cooper. I'm the Director of Culture as Diplomacy. And really, this is a special evening uh, to be able to work with the, my dear colleague, friend, and mentor, Vishaka Desai, on the inauguration of her new book. Congratulations, Vishaka. It's really a wonderful book, and it's a wonderful journey. And I think it's it takes the idea of the personal and the family and enlarges it into an understanding of, of our common humanity and the kind of global world, world that we live in. And uh, tonight, as you know, we are graced to have two, one former president of the Asia Society and our current president of the Asia Society, Kevin Rudd, who is president and CEO and so I, I think we have a special moment where we can reflect on what is it that comes out of the personal that allows us to be global in a different way than, than simply studying political science at college. At least that's what I think. Um, and then we have Pico Iyer here, the extraordinary author, old friend of, of Asia Society. We have uh, launched so many of his books, but he feels like he's really part of the family. So again, we're back to family. This does feel like more than a metaphor. And, and yet it's a very personal, it's the personal journey that really emerges in terms of how we know how we're living our lives and how we can make a difference. So I would like to turn to Vishaka first because the World as Family is a wonderful read, but it's a very personal read. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you decided that that was, that was the frame to, to approach this book. Well, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Pico, for really joining us, joining me, because I'm most grateful for your willingness to find time from your busy schedule. I know, Kevin, you're in Brisbane. Pico, you've been in Japan. You've just arrived back in California. So we are already continuing to think about the world as family, just right here in the Zoom screen. Um, Rachel, the, the way I started thinking about this book was much more because of the students that I work with and young people I work with. And it has as much to do with Asia 21 the group that's part of the Asia Society, as it is my current students and the exchange students that I meet today. Um, because the questions they kept asking is that they all are like global natives. They are netizens. They have their world in their palm. And they kept saying, but wait a minute, how can I be part of the world and still feel like I'm locally rooted? Is it possible? to actually to be somewhere, to be somebody while I'm always becoming? That was the question. And that actually made me feel that I think it was really worth asking myself, how did I become so passionate about this thing called global? What is it? So it's not so much about who I am, but it is about how did I get to be where I am and who I'm becoming all the time? Because there's some sense of changing oneself that becomes very powerful and yet feel that I could be rooted, that I can be multi-local, if you will, because there are two countries I call home, US and India. I've lived in the US a lot longer than I've lived in India. And at the same time, India is still a home. So is the United States. But because of that multi-rooted belonging, I think there is a possibility of actually having a more capacious sense of how to be part of the world. And it was that idea of how did I become who I am that made me think about writing this book. It's as much for the students that I work with as also all of us who have made homes in multiple places my favorite line about Pico that he has said is that it isn't about the piece of soil. It is about the soul and where you find home, where you feel at home. And that is actually partly to figure out how do we create agency from that idea of multiplicity is 
I was trying to figure that out. So this book is really an excavation of the byways and pathways to get there. And I hope that it works for everybody else because many of us have the same kind of stories. It's not, even if you haven't traveled, you often have multiplicity within you. And so those of us who want to connect to the world, it's written for everybody. And they're everybody's stories, not just my story. You know, you start with this image of the banyan tree and, and a, a kind of seminal moment when you're, I think about five years old. And I'm just wondering, you talked about being rooted, deeply rooted. That metaphor is so powerful. And I'm wondering from Kevin, if, if there are similar ideas that have come from his own journey, thinking about becoming the kind of global soul that you are. Well, thanks for the question, um, uh, Rachel, and great to be with you, uh, uh, Congratulations on the book. Uh, uh, books for all of us who are authors are a labor of love. And there is much love uh, in this book uh, from um, what I can see um, coming forth from its pages. I love the story about the banyan tree. Um, and uh, I know enough about the history of the Buddha to know uh, that uh, banyan trees have a particular significance. Um, so what's my um, small banyan tree in Australia? Um, as a kid um, growing up on a farm in rural Australia, to the great despair of my father, I would often disappear on the back of a horse to the farthest parts of the property with a little book uh, and then just sit under a tree and read <laughs> because I had no interest in animal husbandry. I had no interest in beef cattle. I had no interest in dairy cattle. Um, farm life was kind of nice because the scenery was good. Uh, but I was lost in a world of um, books and ideas. So as a little kid, and here I'm talking about um, under the age of uh, 11, um, that was my own small banyan tree uh, experience. And through the world of books, having grown up in reasonably remote rural Australia, uh, that was my um, pathway to begin to read about a world way beyond Australia's shores to begin to read about the uh, diversity that was Asia uh, and to, for the first time, cast my eyes on black and white photographs and the occasional colour photograph of the extraordinary qualities of uh, Asian antiquities and architecture. So that was um, a kid growing up under an Australian banyan tree, if you like. Amazing. Rachel. I think what's interesting about that, Kevin, is that one of the things I talk about and that is not just the banyan tree, but reading under a tree. Just what a pleasure it was. And I actually grew up in a relatively big city and my father had about 30,000 books. So I can't say I grew up in a farmland, that's for sure. <laughs> However, it is true that my father also used to say as a freedom fighter that the best thing that could have happened to him was to be imprisoned in the British prison. Now, who would think that that was such a good idea? But he said that that actually allowed him to read because when he was outside, he was too busy fighting and organizing and working with people. So that was when he would read and write. And he often said that books were his way to open his eyes to the world. And one of the first books that he translated and wrote about was, of course, at the age of 27, the biography of Lenin. <laughs> he had never been anywhere. He, but that was because he was a socialist at the time and he mm -hmm. wanted to figure out what that was and he was mm -hmm. going to read that. But that idea of books and art as actual literature, as kind of windows onto the world, which is what I, I actually feel that for me, it was reading and it was dancing and it mm -hmm. was having sculptures in our backyard and making up stories about those sculptures that I actually, I come from, as you know, from a big family. I thought everybody made up stories, but it turns out that's not really true. But I did because I also became a dancer. And as a result, what I often think of as Arnafisi, the another great Iranian American writer who wrote this thing called Republic of Imagination, mm. it kind of opens the world, the imagination opens the world beyond yourself. And that 
therefore creates interest and passion. And then you do other things. So it doesn't matter where you come from. You know, some people have asked me, said, well, you wrote this book, aren't you very privileged? Because not everybody has a chance to travel. And I just realized from what you've said, everybody has a chance to read. Everybody That's has true. a chance to see something. And it's about curiosity and imagination, right? That's true. I mean, uh, you spoke of your father growing up and being, um, as it were, uh, educated in a British prison. I thought you were talking about Australia there. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, because uh, we began as a British prison and um, many of our friends around the world would still regard it as, as one. Um, but um, these are lost in the, uh, the mists of time as well. But, you know, your dad's experience is quite fascinating because if you read, as you know, the, um, the life of Mandela uh, and his reflections, uh, the one thing that was uh, made available to him on Robben Island uh, was uh, books and uh, his ability to read and to reflect and to write. And these are important, uh, you know, back to the days of John Bunyan, uh, these are important um, nourishments of the soul. And not just nourishments of the soul, but frankly, firing a creative imagination. And then in, even in the relative isolation of that, to then conclude that in the wonderful world of a wider civilization, no man slash woman is an island um, unto himself or herself. Which brings us back to your core thematic, which is as you navigate the world in your own life, and I'm sorry if I'm throwing myself over the top of uh, your discourse here, uh, Rachel, forgive me, um, but uh, come in and tell me to shut up whenever you want, um, is um, your central thesis, which is retaining individual identity while at the same time engaging in complete diversity and being per permanently comfortable with that ambiguity as opposed to seeking, if my paraphrase here, a false clarity. Um, so so um, uh, that, I think, is quite a neat distillation of, let's call it the uh, Desai uh, Doctrine, uh, the well, Pshaka Doctrine. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. I mean, you know, partly, Evan, I wrote the book at the time of almost heightened anti-globalism. Mm. I started thinking about it, and that mm. was around the time, you know, when Trump was elected. And I talk about the shock to the system. And that was to say, everybody was saying that if you, globalism is anti-national, it is anti-local, it's out there, it's abstracted, it's the Davos man, you know, things of that sort. Mm. And I kept saying, wait a minute, that doesn't describe who I am. Mm. So what about people like us? What about people like us who actually look to think of local, national, global as a palimpsest, as a way that things fuse, but also get confused for sure. And you don't give up the specificity just because you believe, believe in something bigger. And then COVID happens. And do I say any more? It's like the world lives in your body, you know? That pathogen lives in our body, no matter where you are. If you get it in India or Af Africa or Australia or India or US. And it made me realize that actually all the crises that we think about, whether it's pandemic, whether it is climate, if we don't develop this capacious, expansive sense of being part of the community of this global citizenry, 7.7 .7 billion that live in this world, if you don't think of it as a community, we're doomed. <laughs> we better get on with the program here. So I always felt like I had to double down on this idea. And there, this Vedic phrase, which is almost cliched in India, you know, I mean, I, I was so worried about using that, that I thought I should just give up on it. I literally was going to give up on it. And then when COVID happened and I said, the brilliance of that phrase is to think of the family as a unit, which we can all understand and apply it to the world and recognize that in the functional family, each one of us think of ourselves as a unit and think of ourselves as an individual. We understand that relational quality, right? Not everything is about just 
me, although that sometimes happens. But you also have to think about sometimes you give up something. Sometimes you have to actually not hold grudges for the sake of the unit. And that made me feel that if you think about the global family, it's pretty dysfunctional and we need to heal and repair it because we got to figure out how we think of ourselves both broadly and locally. So you're very right that it is confusing sometimes. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to write about those things in the book, because it's not all hunky-dory. It's not all comfortable, but we got to get through that. We got to live in that liminal space to be able to own that idea of expansive belonging. The, um, I remember as a kid, um, uh, when I was a teenager, actually, studying uh, Chinese in Taiwan. And I would have been about 19 years old at this stage. So I'd taken a little time out from university to spend um, several months in Taipei. <clears throat> and back in those days, which is uh, just after the Mesolithic period, the, um, uh, I um, uh, was on a bus uh, riding to, from the place I stayed uh, to the school at Taiwan Normal University. And, um, and I was on the bus. I was the only foreigner on the bus. So a bunch of Chinese folks. Uh, and, uh, and this little boy, wonderful voices of uh, absolute politically incorrect clarity, says in Chinese, Mummy, look at the big-nosed foreigner. Da uh, bizi, the big-nosed foreigner. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and then... Then he said, Mummy, look at how hairy his legs are. It was summer. I was wearing shorts. Okay. And then, then he says, I wonder if it will hurt if I pull them out, at which point he leant over and pulled out one of my leg hairs. <laughs> <laughs> and so I then turned around and said, maintaining, I thought, reasonable calm for a 19-year-old, um, <laughs> you know, testosterone-laden sort of Australian male, uh, said, <laughs> which is this nose is not that big. And when, you take, and when you take the hair out of my leg, it really does hurt. Um, but, but have a wonderful day. <laughs> and so, I so anyway. I all have these wonderful stories. You know, the one that I didn't write in the book, and Pico, you would appreciate this. This is 1966-67 in California, in Santa Barbara, where... I had met your parents ever so briefly, which is amazing, as an exchange student. And at one point there was a big Chicano movement, but nobody had really seen too many Indians. So these group of Chicano students, males, gathered around me and started yelling at me in Spanish. And I could tell that it was something about, what the hell, you not speaking in Spanish? And I didn't know what to do. So I just started talking in Gujarati. I just, I, that was the only thing I could do. And they were like, what, what's going on? And I just said, I am not, I am not Chicana. I'm sorry, you know? And they finally went away. But it's one of those things like on those moments, how do you deal with your otherness? And at the same time, recognize that they don't really mean ill although sometimes they do, but you better figure that out. So it's wonderful to have you uh, of right here, partly because of our non-connection connection from the early days and then uh, our life trajectories that have gone in so many different directions. Yes, I mean, when I was reading your book, I was remembering how Ohan Pamuk sometimes says about being bicultural, two heads are better than one. And as you may know, in, in Japan, where I spend a lot of time, uh, people used to, of, who are half Japanese and half American, used dismissively to be called hafu. And now they <laughs> reclaim themselves as double. We're twice as good as you because we have access to two different cultures. And you know, one of the things I loved about your book was the sense that it was by coming to the US, A, as you were saying just now, it awoke you to the Vietnam War and other things, but it enabled you to see India much better than before. And, and I almost got the sense that the US 
instructed you in, in the first person singular, how to carve your own identity away from the family and society. And India always rooted you in the we, and then you were able to bring those together. Is that sort of how you feel? My God, that is brilliant. It's perfect. Actually, somebody had suggested that I should call this book from I to we and we to I. And I thought that sounds a little too pop psychology thing, but you're exactly right that I think that it was the first time that I actually had to kind of fend for myself and figure things out. And because of that, you also sort of ask yourself, who are you? And Vietnam War was a perfect example for me because to be able to say, are you for or against this war? And as I talk about in the book, it just made me very nervous that we only thought of Vietnam as war, not a place, not a country, not a culture, whether you were for or against. And I kept saying, I'm talking about Halong Bay and these names. I have no idea about who they are. And to my 17 year old mind, it was literally to say, God forbid there should be a war between India and the US. And people would say India war. They wouldn't know that there are millions of people and there are lots of culture and it's 6,000 year old civilization and whatnot. And that made me kind of aware of the also intersection of politics and culture in a way that got me going into the life that I've led since, you know, in a way. Um, so you're very right that because I spent 17 years of my life initially rooted in India and in a very Indian household, if you will, not in the household that spoke English, that went to convents and Christian schools that like most of the people from upper middle class families would have gone. But at the same time, it was, it was the early independent India that was so different, right? Because I think that the fact that both of my parents were very open, and especially my father, as I told you, you know, writing a book on Lenin, and then he actually was writing novels that were questioning the idea of marriage, you know? And so he was the one who brought the newspaper to me to say, he's a newspaper man, but still saying, here is this opportunity. You can go to the United States and you should take that. And I was the one who's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know anybody there. What am I going to do? But it freed me up in a way. But it also because the kernel of that idea of the I were already there. And I think that I often think that if that wasn't the case, I don't know if I would have embrace that idea of the I to the extent that I did. So well, I'd like to ask a question, actually, and this brings in Kevin as well, because Asia society was years, and that whole idea of how you know Asia, you know, what you said about the Vietnam War, it was so true in the United States, Vietnam was the name of a war, not a culture, not a country, not a history. And so much of, I think, what, what your work and our work at the Asia Society is really about trying to frame that. So I wondered if you, and, and I'd like to hear from Kevin too, about how we, how we try to deepen, and your, your notion of capaciousness is, is, I think, relevant here. How do we, how do we show that kind of, of a global perspective? for our audiences globally. Let me have a fist at that, um, Rachel. Um, essentially what we're talking about here uh, is the question of consciousness. And, um, and consciousness is not just, as we know, a concept in psychology. It's a concept in uh, sociology. It's a concept in political science. And frankly, it's a concept in ideology. And going back to your father's work on Lenin, um, the Shaka, uh, consciousness and its role in mobilizing political action is a key element of Marxist Leninist thought. And certainly it's alive in, um, in Mao Zedong's thinking and it's alive in Xi Jinping's thinking, this whole question of consciousness. Um, so it's not, as it were, simply uh, an abstraction. 
uh, it is a reality. So here is the challenge uh, for institutions like ours, how to cause um, individuals uh, and communities and societies and nations to be comfortable with multiple consciousnesses. That is my consciousness of myself as an individual, my consciousness of myself as a member of a family, uh, my consciousness of myself as a member of my local community, uh, of as a member of this thing we call the nation, and regrettably, or, or just it's a reality, we are a world of national tribes. But simultaneously, uh, tempering that, consciousness also as the member uh, of what, for example, the Buddha would have conceived of as a, um, a world community, a wide community, a seamless community of humankind, and then even a deeper consciousness of the blend between humanity uh, and the wider creation, uh, the natural order and the planet itself, which takes us on to climate. And so on this question of multi-layered consciousness, um, part of our challenge as an institution and part of our opportunity and responsibility and mission as an institution uh, is to move as comfortably as possible across these levels of consciousness in that which we do without feeling as if our intrinsic self or our intrinsic identity is about to be, uh, in the case of uh, white American males, emasculated, or in the case of white Australian males, emasculated. Uh, but in fact, it is, um, is something which is uh, natural, normal, and frankly, expanding of the human soul and expanding of the human imagination. And finally, then leads us to a view that, yes, I do have a national tribe, in this case, a country of former criminals, Australia. Uh, yet I am a member of an international family and a wider Asian family. And I am a citizen of the planet. Uh, and I've got a common consciousness about what we do to preserve that planet. Our mission, therefore, as an institution is operating across these multiple planes and to cause people to feel comfortable at operating at these different levels of consciousness and not feeling that they're about to be extinguished as a person or an individual as a result. Yeah, that's so, so important, Kevin, because I do think that in that idea of consciousness and the levels of consciousness, and I would add philosophical consciousness, right? And the mindfulness, of, as you might call in the Buddhist tradition, which is to be aware of where you are contextually, as well as inside yourself. But as, as an institution, I think that one of the ways that one can think about this is both through the personal story, the creative level, and to the policy dimension. So it's a macro and it's a micro. And it is the creative in between so that actually there is the level of consciousness that can be had by these different levels of individual versus collective versus abstracted and what that would look like. And I think no, we don't ever talk about that in an institution setting, but in a way it's about the delivery and conceiving of the initiatives that actually can come together. And one of the reasons I think that I was really very aware of that when I wrote this book, and the reason I wrote a very personal book, and it's something that Biko, you and I talked about, is that sometimes in the intensely personal is where the world can see themselves in. And out of that, but it doesn't happen by itself. I mean, I, Rachel and I have had this many conversations that I used to say that we have commodified art to such an extent that people can go, they appreciate the art, but they, we don't always provide the avenues to think of art also as a way to open your mind and question things. The best of art can do that. It, it both is about transcendent quality of art, which is art can stand beyond time and space. And I, you know, in the book, I talk about my experience working with fifth graders, African-American kids in Cleveland and to take them first in front of dancing Shiva. And they didn't even know who I was, let alone that sculpture, you know? And then six weeks later, 
those were their friends. They were actually talking to them, the sculptures, and to me, like I was their friend. And that got me hooked on museum. I was a political science major. But what got me hooked in the museum was this possibility that art can actually cut across borders and time. At the same time, if you look today in the community of art museums and institutions, everything is very contested because the specificity of art that was avoided for so long in the museum world, actually now it's coming back to haunt us. Mm. And people are saying, who owns it? Where is it? What is it? What does it mean? For whom? All these are very important questions because we have avoided it for so long. However, if you go only in that direction, the pendulum will swing so far that you forget the power of art Mm. to connect to imagine, to actually go across. And so there is something about this idea of the rational, the emotional, in a kind of Greek way, it is the doing, the making, and asking that actually needs to be part of how we approach the programming, right? So that's, I like your uh, kind of uh, classification of consciousnesses that I think is a really useful thing. I thought that was very good, too. And I think in your uh, example from Cleveland, you actually have people, these kids are interacting with the art. It's not a passive looking at art. You them up moving, you know, thinking where their balance is. So, So there's something about the embodied experience which I think actually speaks to the consciousness that that Kevin's also referring to, that we know ourselves in different ways. And I think, Kiko, you talk about this a lot in in many of your books as well. Yes, and well, I'll confess, I was thinking a lot about the Asia Society and why Vishaka was so made for it when I read um, all the passages about dance in the book for two reasons. One, as Vishaka was just saying, because dance speaks in every language across every border. But also I got the strong sense that dance was a a portable home for Vishaka. And when she was suddenly in the United States as an Indian woman with very few other Indians around, uh, dance was her anchor and it's what rooted her. And it reminded me that a home these days is not so much where you happen to live. It's what lives inside you. It's your language, it's your art form, it's your passion that you take wherever you are and that helps to ground you. And and I think one of the moments that really struck me in the book was when Vishaka pointed out how she could study Indian art actually better in the United States than might have been possible in India. It reminded me, I think, that Mahatma Gandhi encountered the Bhagavad Gita only when he went to England to to study. And again, that cuts across the simple binaries that so often we construct. Um, Is that fair, Vishaka? Absolutely. And I think that what's very interesting about that is that it happens to so many people that when you go away from your country, you actually look at it from outside in and recognize what you don't know and what you need to know and why you're so passionate. And I think when I was growing up, especially as a graduate student, it was because actually, even though India had gained independence, the education system was still entirely colonial. Even though I went to a nationalist school in high school and all the way through grade school, we learned lots of things. I mean, because I was in fact not in an English medium school, we learned about some shlokas, not all, but we learned Sanskrit. I learned Sanskrit all the way from fifth grade to 11th grade. And I did all these outside exams. And so I mean, I talk to my colleagues today who are my generation, or even a little bit younger, and who have all gone to English medium schools, they actually learn very little mm. about Indian history, mm. Indian philosophy, Indian thought, because it's not taught in those schools. Mm. And as a result, where you end up starting is somewhere else. And But that also gives you some notion of being outside in, and then you have to figure out the inside out part. <laughs> as to where does that fit, you know? Um, and it's confusing. It's very confusing sometimes. As I talk about the Vishwanath Temple, right, in the book, uh, very confusing. Hey, hey, Rachel, it's Kevin. Uh, let me just um, 
uh, upset the order of things completely by throwing a question at both Vishaka and uh, Pico. Um, those listening to um, this, watching this, will may say this is a dialogue among elites about different levels of consciousness. Um, and um, and wherever we have come from and, and whatever wherever we began, we would be seen as such. Um, so here's our dilemma. Um, we are uh, discussing and debating uh, a question among elites about levels of consciousness, um, and particularly between the local, the national, and the global, and beyond that, the planetary, in my view. Right. Uh, and, but secondly, we live in countries, uh, not just the United States, but also elsewhere in the world, um, uh, given the dynamics of contemporary India, uh, given the uh, dynamics of, um, of contemporary China, uh, where, uh, and certainly you see this in some of the politics of Europe as well, but more broadly, which is uh, always the predisposition to reinforce the hardest of lines uh, between us and them. Uh, between inside and outside, between uh, nation and, uh, as it were, those beyond the nation. Um, and uh, the tribalisms, uh, which we all know to pre-exist, uh, in the hands of demagoguery, uh, are then, as it were, accentuated. Of course, Trumpianism in the United States took this to its own um, uh, grotesque extreme uh, in the US, a country which uh, all of us love. Uh, and we know is infinitely better than Trumpian reductionism. Um, but here is our dilemma. And the question I put to both of you is, uh, given, for example, the diatribe on Fox each day, uh, which is us be them, um, uh, little identity, uh, and be very comfortable in that, external identities, be frightened of that, be fearful of that. Uh, how do we plunge ourselves into the mainstream? Uh, which is to make a difference on this question of consciousness so that kids uh, sitting under their local bunyan's tree in Boise, Idaho, uh, actually understand that the world is a wonderful place, not to be frightened of, but to be engaged with. Um, Pico, um, pardon me, Rachel, for jumping in over the top. But Perfect I just thought question, it was... because I think it, it's a 300-pound gorilla that has to be handled, right? Yeah. So we have to ask that question. Pico, you go first, and I have some thoughts too. Well, I think the exciting development of the modern world is those kids under the banyan tree in Boise, Idaho, are more and more surrounded by people from India and Vietnam and Ethiopia and Mexico, and especially in our big cities, it's pronounced in the US, but Australia, England, France, everywhere else too. Uh, and even if they never leave their neighborhood, in their classroom, they're exposed to other cultures in a way that was unthinkable when Vishaka and I were growing up. And, uh, and I take great confidence in the way I feel that nationalism is on the rise, partly because it's on the run, because it's feeling so <laughs> And that's a nice phrase. <laughs> incrementally, um, the world every day more borders are collapsing because every day somebody from Nigeria is marrying somebody from Denmark and the child that arises out of that union belongs to neither and both. And that black and white distinctions fade in the age of uh, Kamala Harris or President Obama because they're black and white, as it were. Well, they're many colors. Um, and I'm always struck by that figure, which I think is true, which is 1958, 97% of Americans disapproved of mixed race marriages. By 2014, the figure was 3%. So in my lifetime alone, 97% disapproval of mixed race down to 3%. So you're absolutely right. We hear the loudest voices of outrage on Fox News and elsewhere. But I remember I was in San Francisco once and I was talking to a woman and she said, well, maybe I don't think so warmly about Islam. And lo and behold, my daughter marries somebody from Iran. How can I fail to love my granddaughter, who's now Islamic? Not everybody is so enlightened, but I do feel, I think Vizchaka was talking about those of us who have many homes. And I think the number's up to something like 300 million now and increasing very quickly. And it can't go backwards. I mean, the world is only on an individual level moving in that direction. I, I absolutely agree with you about the gulf between those of us who are seeing things at 38,000 feet and the tens of millions who are crossing borders um, on the ground in a much more undefended way. And I think that's a very serious gap that, and we're seeing its consequences everywhere. But I think if we were to have the same conversation at 2050, um, 
our, our cities and our cultures are only going to be even more mingled and mixed up. And um, I don't know, what do you think, Vishaka? Yeah, I, you know, it's so interesting you should say that because one of the reasons I kept bringing young people into this conversation in the book is to actually recognize that if all studies show the Generation Z, especially, meaning 18 to 24, you know, people were born around 2000, that they are much more aware and passionate about climate, more tolerant of immigrants, and more feeling of diversity of people and being able to marry who they want, et cetera, et cetera. The statistics, as you pointed out, also go in that direction. However, it's also true that as Du Wei Ming said long ago, the great Chinese philosophy professor at Harvard, who then went off to Beida actually, and then retired, he wrote in early 1990s and he said, you know, globalization and balkanization are the two sides of the same coin. Meaning it's precisely because things are getting mixed up and Borderings or borders are somewhat collapsing in terms of people's movement and communication is why people are trying to fight for the smallest land, the smallest patch, the thing they have. And it's natural to some extent. Then the politicians get involved and they really use that. So, uh, Kevin, you know, I also feel that the same question was just asked of me on by an IR person, right, for uh, NPR. And my, my answer was the same, which is to say that let's also not forget that Kamala Harris did get elected, that Biden did get 7 million more votes, and that there is that other side to our society that we have to cultivate because the, as Pico says, the the other side is so negative and so vocal and so vociferous that to some extent, we have to keep looking at glass half full and half empty. And what can we do to make the half full side a little bit fuller, even if you can't fight the half empty all the way? And I do think that in countries, especially like the United States, um, that people are so much more used to seeing lots of different kinds of people that we need to figure out that they don't just go into their small cocoons, but actually go beyond their cocoon. And at the same time, I mean, I think it's a tough battle, but if I feel like we just have to do it one story at a time, one person at a time from bottom up and also top down and keep doing it and see where we can go, because I think it's serious. I mean, I don't, underestimate the fight that we're in. And it, the inflection point is very clear right now. And so how do we, I mean, somebody asked me, said, what are you going to say to the Proud Boys? And I said, you know what? I would like to talk to them, but they won't come to the table to talk to me. So I'm not going to worry about the Proud Boys because I can't change them. But there's a whole group of in-between groups of people who actually were just as horrified as all of us were about the 6th January insurrection. People who are not so hardcore. So maybe we just have to go to the sort of the in-between groups. And I, I will quote late Richard Holbrook, um, my former chair, good buddy, but also my mentor. And when I took over at the Asia Society and he said, Vishaka, just remember one rule of thumb, which is that in any organization and any place, there is going to be one third of the group will come with you no matter what. Then there is a one third that's in between, wanting to wait and see what happens. And then the other one third, no matter what you do, you can't convince them. Most people focus too much on the one third that you can't convince focus on the one third in the middle with the one third you already have, and at least you got 66%. So I kind of, I think that that's a good model, you know, in a way. Uh, and so I hope that, you know, we, we all have to use all the tools at our disposal, because as you said, in India, in Turkey, everywhere, especially what is happening in terms of using people's fear to divide and divide and divide, that somewhere we have to actually get to the fear. 
and see if there's other possibilities that people can see. And my faith is in young people, I really do think. On the whole book doctrine of uh, a third, a third, a third, and uh, we've had the uh, Bashaka doctrine, we've now got the whole book doctrine. <laughs> the, uh, the, um, and by the way, Pico, I love the idea of uh, uh, nationalism arising because um, nationalism is running. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and my paraphrase, not exactly the words you used, or nationalism in retreat, is... The reflections just made, both by Pico and by uh, Bashaka, I think uh, wonderful uh, expositions of what's um, going on, let's call it um, in the wider American community over time. And, uh, and yeah, for which, if you like, uh, both uh, President Obama and Vice President Harris, um, kind of the icing on the cake for what's really happening. And by the way, Pico, when we spoke about mixed marriages in Australia as a kid growing up, that was between Catholics and Protestants. That wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't between people of different ethnicities. But I think it's a fascinating, uh, as it were, uh, transition from the 97 down to the three. But here's my, my next difficult set of propositions. Let's just say uh, in um, countries like the United States, uh, Canada, the United Kingdom, uh, various parts of Europe um, and um, and in uh, countries over time like Australia, uh, this sort of natural diversity simply becomes um, uh, uh, endemic uh, and it becomes uh, unassailable and it's the reality. But do we face uh, parallel to that um, um, uh, a further binary between societies such as that uh, which become comfortable to use um, Vashaka's term of um, almost multiple selves and multiple identities, um, uh, grounded in in uh, uh, in traditions of deep um, civic civic diversity. Do you face a challenge um, in dealing with other national societies, which in turn become much more entrenched in their own ethno nationalism? Uh, within Europe, for example, uh, let's look at Orbán's Hungary. Uh, look at the uh, migration flows into uh, Hungary, which are kind of zero. Um, uh, Orban's nationalism is an ethno-nationalist Hungarian nationalism. Um, and, uh, and in fact, uh, wreaking considerable havoc across uh, Europe. But it's a small country. Look at other uh, ethno-nationalist um, constituencies, perhaps uh, in um, uh, elements of contemporary uh, India, perhaps in elements of contemporary China. Uh, where the phenomenon we've just described unfolding with the uh, diversity of the United States uh, is, is not unfolding uh, to the same uh, extent, at least. So I'm always haunted uh, as I reflect on the history of Weimar Germany, uh, which is the, um, s the spontaneous combustion of diversity in the Berlin of the 20s and the 30s, uh, early 30s, and then being overwhelmed by an ethno-nationalism uh, at the same time, which was infinitely more disciplined, infinitely more organised, infinitely more, uh, dare I say it, fascistic. So, um, uh, so th there's, there's a hard question for you, Pico and um, uh, Bashaka, and my second round of apologies to Rachel. <laughs> and then we'll get back. I mean, I think that actually, if you look at the Indian situation and, and you look at the citizenship question that became such a big one in India, it was really amazing as to how the young people of all persuasions came out in a big way to fight against that idea that who gets to be the citizen of this country and who doesn't. And so I do think that there is this issue. I mean, if you look at you know, Erdogan, and you look at a number of other countries, Bolsonaro, even to some extent Modi, and also in China, the kind of ethno-nationalism that you're describing is very much there. What it will be interesting is to see how are the young people getting motivated to actually come out and how are they actually taking that to the next level, which is, it's one thing to fight and protest on the street. Can you actually turn it into action? And that requires other kinds of leaders. And in so many of these countries, I find that the problem is the paucity of leadership on the other side. 
there is strong leadership in terms of people who are fighting hard for the ethno-nationalism or restrictive form of nationalism, but there isn't the same level of leadership on the other side, especially in the countries that at least have some semblance of democracy. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think young people are there, it just, uh, to some extent. I mean, I, I don't want to romanticize that, but I think more so than one might think. I can speak from the perspective of somebody spending a lot of time in Japan, which is probably one of the most homogeneous societies on earth and not moving forwards very much. On the one hand, they showcase Naomi Osaka as the face of the the Olympics. But on the other hand, um, both of you know better than I, um, very, very entrenched sense of who they are and what it is to be Japanese. And I think culturally that makes for certain strength. But geopolitically, we've seen Japan almost secede from the rest of the the world and compared with China, which uh, Prime Minister Rudd knows so well and South Korea, um, really losing out here, one of the most sophisticated developed countries in Asia. And in terms of English language proficiency, I believe 29th out of 30 nations. And in psychologically, metaphorically and literally, Japan doesn't speak the language of the rest of the world, especially compared with China, say. So I think cultures like that, the more they entrench, the more they find that they're isolating themselves and they're going to lose out in fundamental ways because they're not on the wavelength of much of the rest of um, the planet. I do think, I mean, this overlaps with a very significant problem that actually Vishaka's book reminded me, which is the divide between city and country. And that takes us a little bit back to Boise, Idaho, that in some ways, New York is closer to Mumbai than it is to Buffalo or, or, or Rochester. And that that divide, I think, is what has led to resentment in the US and the UK and no doubt other places. Uh, but I think we have so many examples in which um, isolationism just doesn't, doesn't pay. It's hard to survive if you're an island unto yourself these days. We have to remind Rachel, that, yeah. Uh, Rachel, the, um, you, are, you probably have the greatest institutional knowledge of the Asian society of all of us. Um, uh, Vishaka was a fantastic president. Uh, I've got my training wheels on. Uh, Pico has uh, been uh, in and out of our doors over many years. Um, lead us uh, in uh, some disc- discussion as to um, where we contribute on this in your own view, uh, Rachel, and um, let's uh, take the conversation in that direction with the Shaka and uh, with others. Well, I have, to, I have to share something from my own history because I was at UCLA in a program called World Arts and Cultures. And before I ever knew there was an Asia Society, uh, it was a dance, anthropology, folklore program. And these amazing performances came to UCLA and they were from the Asia Society. And so we interacted with the artists. We, we not only saw the performances, but they were part of our, our interaction. We were engaged. And I think that it, it has as much to do with why I'm now at the Asia Society as anything. So, so I think that that the the uh, the long run of of what kinds of impact an institution can have needs to be considered, and and much like uh, what Vishaka is talking about, you know, with her with her uh, work and Pico as well, and you as well. I I think that we we have an impact. Uh, there is the immediacy of policy. And there's, you know, I think of something like Myanmar. So, so I have been a fan of the work of the music of Burma, the music and dance of Burma for 40 years. I first went there 20 years ago to do projects with the Asia Society. Now we have this terrible junta and, and crisis. And the relationship is not only about thinking of people in a as a pity or, or you know, it, it has a fulsome side to it. It has a three dimensionality that, that I think says, this is, these are my people too. These really are my people and I really care. So, so in thinking about the institution, I, I, I think one of the amazing things about it is that it has a way of understanding that policy is informed by culture. 
the arts transform you and the stories, the literature, you know, all of this is, is a whole in, in my estimation. And so when I think of what the institution can do in this moment where we're thinking about interdependence, I, I think it's, it's finding those touch points where we come together. You know, it's, it's sort of the people in, in uh, more rural areas. Okay, maybe this policy issue was the one that hit them. Or maybe it was meeting somebody from another place. Or, you know, the, anyway, I'm, I'm just on, on the uh, power of, of an institution to be more than what the individuals are and that coming together. Well, I think that, you know, I'm, first of all, I started the study even before Rachel did, Kevin, just, just so you know. So, and I, it's delightful to actually hear Rachel talk about it because one of the things that I think as an institution, we can make an impact is we're a mid-sized institution, right? So I always used to say that if you're just riding the wave, you can't make an impact. You got to make the wave. You got to be ahead of the curve a little. You have to see things that others don't see. And so when we started doing contemporary art, this is now 30 years ago, when we did the first major Asian American show that actually to this day, people use it as an exhibition catalog because as a, as a classroom textbook, because nothing like that exists still, even now. So the way I think about it is to at least recognize that what are the big gaps and what can we do that others can't do? Okay. And how do we do it well? And you know that as well as anybody. And I do think that there've been cycles. So for example, in the performing arts in the sixties and seventies, Beatty Gordon was it. And I too, I was in Ann Arbor as a graduate student and I saw chow dancers from India and the, Burmese dancers that came from Burma at the time. Nobody had any access to this material then. It was the Asian society that did it. Then later on, it didn't make any sense for us to keep doing that because a lot of people are doing it. So then in the 90s, we actually went for commissioning of major pieces by Asian American and other contemporary artists. That was then a new form. Similarly, and I would say that both Bob and Marshall, what they did in terms of, you know, Marshall Bhutan and, and Bob Oxen, my husband now, but then president, did the very first major Asian American symposium in the country, bringing people together. Then lots of people were doing it. We didn't need to do that. So we have to always find things that you can make a bigger difference, give voice to things that other people are avoiding or are not seeing. And I think part, and it's not just about the Asian society. I mean, I just think about what is special in a three-dimensional way for an institution like the Asian society. And that's what I do now at the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia. And that is that it's a unique little place that Lee Bollinger had an idea to develop. And that was to say, we are in this world today the usual siloed disciplinary models of thinking and usual nationalistic based knowledge is not enough. How can we create something that is not just interdisciplinary, not just transnational, but really looks at issues differently, thinks differently, and then start a whole graduate program. And it is very clear to me that this is going to be the way that other people are going to have to pick up on. And so how do you create something that is needed to be done and try to figure out how to make it happen? And that I think is, is one of the charge with the world we live in right now. I mean, it comes back to what you were saying and that is that with COVID, with climate crisis, it just reminds us again and again, we don't have a choice. We better think a new way because as you said, the planet isn't gonna wait for us if we don't do something. And how do we as individuals really begin to think about this more holistic, more, I almost feel like 20th century was so much about specificity of knowledge. We needed that. 21st century has to be about 
synthetic form of knowledge that actually brings these different things together. And in that place, people like us have a lot to say because we have double identity, as Pico, you said before. <laughs> I, I just want to open it up and make sure that if anyone has questions in the audience that you can put them into the chat on uh, Facebook or YouTube that we're... we're and I also want to make sure that we get to have questions because I know you've lots of notes and we didn't get to any of that. But so... Well, well maybe I'll ask, because we've been talking about the challenges to the, the global society you're describing, which are the places or people that you think are modeling it very well? If somebody would say, challenge you and say, well, globalism is, is on the decline, where would you find places of hope? Well, you know, at least I look for those places and so and people. And so one of the things, for example, that in fact I'm involved with, Rachel is involved with, is new, this new fledgling group called One Shared World. And people from around the world just came together because somebody wrote something and started it. And, it, and young people are involved in a big way. Mm -hmm. And it's because they're saying, we need this. The other one is the project that I'm involved with, which is called Youth in a Changing World. And these are young people from all different parts of the world. And they are dying to connect with one another. Mm -hmm. So Zoom and online stuff has just given them the permission. And they're doing it in a much, much stronger way. I'm now involved with the university that you just talked about with Akash Priya, where all of us came together and said, it is not just about being another Harvard and Yale and Columbia in India. It really is about 21st century way of thinking about the world in which you come together intellectually, emotionally, and performatively. So how do you actually create knowledge that is also about yourself and your relation to the larger world? These are fledgling efforts, but you know I do think that we really have to systematize this thing because there is not a lot of time. I, I really feel that maybe I'm too old, but I just feel like we gotta get on with this, you know, uh, because I think as Kevin has reminded us, Challenges are formidable, but I'm an eternal optimist, so you just keep pushing away. Well, and one of the things that struck me in your book is your chairman of the chairperson of the board of American Field Service, which first sent you to California in 1966-67. Now, almost 9,000 students to 90 nations around the world. It's just exploding. One of, when I was reading your book, I, one of the things that made me think this is going to speak to a lot of people is that you're also very honest about the times when you felt neither here nor there, where you fell between the cracks and the people in the United States would see you as an exotic Indian from another planet and you'd go back home and everyone would say, why do you sound so American? Have you ever figured out a way to navigate past <laughs> that kind of challenge? I think that what I tell my younger colleagues is that be prepared for it because identity is not just how you feel, but how people see you. Mm -hmm. It's an interactive process. And there are some times where the way you see yourself is not the way others will. And it's just the way it is. So I personally feel that the only line I have for that is in the best of times, you can belong everywhere. Mm -hmm. In the worst of times, you belong nowhere. You don't have the option of only a singular belonging. Mm -hmm. Once you go on this journey and the path, it's always gonna come and haunt you. And I mean, I write about it in the book that sometimes people say, but who are you? And it is one of my younger colleagues who said, you want a long story or the short story? Mm -hmm. And I would say, I have at least six identities and each one of them are real and they're contextual. I'm an Indian who lives in America Sometimes I'm an American who happens to be from India. Sometimes I'm an Asian American. And sometimes I'm an American of Asian origin. And sometimes I'm an Ahmedabadi girl who is a New Yorker. And sometimes I'm a New Yorker who actually is from Ahmedabad. But ultimately, it, all of that possibility allows me to think of myself as belonging in the world. And it's that kind of 
multiplicity that can open up the place. So going back to Kevin's question of, are we all privileged? I think one of the reasons I wrote this book is to say, for no matter who you are, if you come from one place and you're going somewhere else, actually have to have to create a sense of agency in that process. So you don't feel like it's always the effect others have on you, but can you actually have an agency in your duality and your multiplicity that would help you to actually open up more? So that how can you have that sense of agency, no matter how privileged or unprivileged you are? I love the moment when your father, I believe he's quoting Gandhi, says, keep your cultural windows open so long as your foundations are strong. And that almost gave me the sense that actually the more rooted you are, the more you can rejoice in diversity. It's actually the people very rooted who can open their doors to everywhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that at the same time, sometimes it's confusing. It just is (laughs) because things, wires get crossed and people want you to do one thing and you're in another place because all of it is also contextual. And so I don't for a minute take this kind of journey as a piece of cake. You know, it's not a walk in the park, but it's, but, but it's exhilarating and the options of not doing it are pretty big. It strikes me, Pico and uh, Vishaka, that there's, there's um, something of a contemporary call uh, uh, on all of us uh, at this time who have been privileged to experience uh, diversity and to have um, flourished through diversity um, to contribute to the next wave of diversity um, and to create uh, through the arts and through culture and through uh, philosophy uh, and ways of thinking um, and worldview, um, almost a new, um, as it were, uh, hymn to the world. Um, That is um, a way in which through uh, anime, through song, through the contemporary cultural media, uh, which um, our uh, globalist uh, nativists, um, our nativist globalists, uh, our global natives already feel at home, but with a little encouragement from the likes of us, uh, give them a new um, hymn to sing. Absolutely uh, true. You know, one of my favorite story, Kevin, uh, when I was the age society, was meeting an African American young man from Harlem who was going to one of our internationally themed high school in Lower East Side. And it took him two hours to get there. And I asked him, why did you want to do this? And he said, I am passionate about anime. And Mm -hmm. I am so crazy about this, but I don't know enough about Japan. So the only Mm -hmm. way I could do this was to go to this school. And he pestered his mother until he get into that school because it was all lottery system. And that tells you something about the power of media where people are seeing things in different places, how to actually encourage and then create systems where they can flourish. And I think that that, you're very right about a new hymn or a hymn that's always existed. After all, the phrase world is family goes back 3000 years. And I always remind myself that while people remember Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the first phrase and first part of the phrase says, it's only those of the limited mind who think of world as their blood, family as their blood relatives. Mm -hmm. It is the magnanimous ones that know that the world is family. That melody, as you say, is alive in so much of the uh, classical wisdom of um, of multiple traditions, totally. uh, uh, from the classical East and the classical West, and and most points in between. Perhaps our contemporary challenge is to augment the uh, melody with our new contemporary harmony. 
which is uh, a harmony with the voices of, uh, of young people from all backgrounds, and frankly, not just all ethnicities, all backgrounds, but um, uh, all socioeconomic backgrounds as well, right. um, so that we transcend uh, through the medium which this provides us with uh, for a kid uh, growing up in, um, in rural Ghana uh, and a kid growing up in, um, in rural Sichuan. Uh, and, uh, and a netizen from, uh, from uh, who's uh, Gujarati um, and the occasional person from suburban Melbourne um, to, um, to get together and, as it were, creatively um, uh, jam uh, about um, where it all goes to from here. Uh, it's otherwise I, I, I become a little fearful that uh, the, the technical media uh, uh, including the creative media, in fact, become exploited by um, uh, different forces, uh, right. the, the darker forces of ethno-nationalism and ultimate uh, uniformity and control, uh, which takes us in the reverse direction. So, I mean, the media so is the media, right? It can create smallest ever clicks or it can create a more openness to the world. Mm -hmm. And we know from studies that, believe it or not, in the global north, young people use the media much more to create cliques, people mm -hmm. that they know and people they want, an ever smaller unit. In the global south, and especially in places like Indonesia and even other parts of India, is that people who have less access to the world use the social media to have more access, to see it as a window onto the world. So we have a challenge, you're right, that in fact, we have to create this very consciously. It goes back to your word consciousness, consciously to create a new hymn, a mm -hmm. new, new poem, a new contemporary message like mm -hmm. which the ancient wisdom has already given us. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's going to have to be the, the final statement there, Bishop, and a, a good one it is, um, because I know that we can go on for, for hours and be a, a Netflix uh, series, and it would probably be very popular, but uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that tonight. I, I do agree that, that uh, one of the things that, that I've seen through the One Shared World group uh, is that young people across the globe are so eager to connect with each other and, and to really think about solutions and new ideas. And I think Asia 21 at Asia Society has a similar impetus. So I think that, that really grappling with the, the, uh, both the digital and the physical reality, the, the, um, the passions that, that bring people together and want them to want to find new ways to connect is very strong. And it's, it's certainly uh, very much the, you know, in your book. So I, I, um, I really appreciate and thank you all. And thanks for apologizing there, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> one direction and, you know, it, it had its own momentum and a, a very fine one, much better than any I had planned so I, I, well, Rachel before you go thank you for holding this together for us all and to, for dealing with the unruliness uh, primarily of myself uh, <laughs> but also uh, Vishaka is quite an unruly person as well Pico was very well behaved um, but uh, but uh, I, I saw it as one long tasking session for you Rachel to now begin uh, crafting the hymn for the world uh, and uh, and the anime for the world. So if you, we could have a meeting on first thing Monday about you you're doing that, uh, that's uh, that's now at the top of your own mission statement. I didn't know that this was about creating a program for the Asia Society, but I'm happy to help. You know, there you go. But Pico, thank you so much for really being part of this, and I do want to have that six hour long conversation another time not in front of other people. And thank you, Kevin, really, for your absolutely engaging, committed uh, involvement. So thank you for being there. And, and thank you, Rachel. Thank you for writing the book and all that you're doing. 
No, thanks. So, My pleasure. Good evening. Over. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you again at the Asia Society. We have wonderful programs that are uh, planned in every area. And if you want to explore any of the, uh, the various topics that have come up tonight and others as well, we're your place. So thanks again and uh, good evening. Thank you. Congratulations, Vashaka. Thank you, Pika. All the best. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Kevin.